Hi! In this video I will tell you about electronics I use to build the audio spectrum display. The idea is simple. Record audio, determine fast Fourier transform, the so-called FFT, and display the results. Seemingly simple, there are a lot of resources in the internet. The algorithm itself is widely used and yet design of electronics is not that simple. This topic is still open. While editing this movie two months after closing the casing, I already have a lot of ideas for modifications. I would like to add a hardware implementation of FFT using FPGA and a separate ADC converter, for example ADS-1256, to reduce ESP32 resources usage. The separate and faster ADC will give a wider bandwidth and more accurate measurements. If not FPGA, then maybe a parallel STM32 chip. After Fring Core 0 of ESP, Wi-Fi connection can be supported and I can already see integration with Home Assistant, Remote Control and many other bells and whistles. So, let's get down to business. The most important element of the design is Dual Core ESP32 chip with a built-in 12-bit SAR ADC converter. Tasks performed by the ESP have been distributed among two cores. Core 0 is responsible for signal sampling and FFT, while Core 1 is responsible for animations and driving the matrix. Back to schematic. The amplified audio signal from the microphone or audio jack reaches the ESP analog input. The signal is then sampled, i.e. with use of mentioned converter, and then the measurements are stored. Energy is supplied from separate 5V 22 amps power supply. Each of the diodes consumes up to 60 mA, so the entire device can use up to 24 amps. So in the program there should be set limit of display brightness. Is 399 LEDs a lot? Not necessarily. These diodes are driven in series using a variable duty cycle. Although the LEDs are seen as a matrix, they are connected into a single strip. So for the last LED to receive a control signal, this signal must pass through all the preceding LEDs. The number of LEDs is limited by both rates, so the more LEDs, the lower the refresh rate of entire strip. Let's look at the datasheet. The manufacturer guarantees that if we want to achieve the refresh rate of 30Hz, we can connect even 1024 LEDs. This is due to transmission speed, which is claimed to be 800,000 bits per one second. Using table with waveforms, we can determine this value. Each bit is encoded with a change of duty cycle, so-called PWM. The period of both 0 and 1 are equal and is 1.25 microseconds, hence the frequency or transmission speed is 800 kilobits per second. The data frame consists of 24 bits, 8 bits for each color channel. It takes 11.97 milliseconds to send 24 bits to each of the 399 LEDs. Also, we add 50 microseconds described in the datasheet as a reset, obtaining 12.02 milliseconds. Hence, display's refresh rate is around 83 Hz. Which diodes should I choose? Should I buy strips or individual LEDs with custom PCBs? I have chosen the second option and prepared boards carrying 7 LEDs. Each column of the display consists of 3 LEDs modules. There are 19 columns, so in total 57 modules are needed. Was it worth the effort? If I were to buy components today, I would pay 26 cents for each LED in 16 pieces strip and 14 cents for single diode. Including price of PCBs, it comes out that purchase of single diodes and PCBs is 20% cheaper. Great, but someone has to solder them all. So if I were to build such a display again, I would buy LED strips. After two weeks, I received a delivery with PCBs. This additional PCB is meant to hold ESP32 and 74125 IC which shifts signal voltage level from 3.3V to 5V. I cleaned soldering iron before longer work, set it to about 400 Celsius degrees, a sip of tea and go. Initial enthusiasm faded away after the first hour. After all, soldering nearly 400 LEDs means 1600 solder pads. 
If someone likes soldering, I hardly recommend it, but be warned, it's get boring quickly. Soldering those diodes is not so difficult. You have to fix one lead so that the diode won't move and then solder the other three. Production line helps a bit, but it still takes a long time. Three evenings for me. Why didn't I solder using methods typical for SMD components? Because I wanted to try different way. Apparently, programmable diodes take quite badly soldering in Reflow Owen. On the back of PCBs, there is space for decoupling capacitors. Ceramic 100 nF suggested by manufacturer and electrolytic and tantalum for energy reserve. To clean PCBs, I use ultrasonic cleaner. I filled it with isopropyl alcohol, put a bunch of bolts, close the lid and start. 3 minutes is enough to remove major of burnt flux. Cleaned bolts must be drained and dried. It is better not to do this indoor. Placing the bolts outside for a couple of minutes is enough even in winter. The next step is to connect three modules to create column, a single displaced band. The spacing between LEDs must be equal, so in Coral Draw I designed template to help with soldering. I'm reusing the design of LED masking frames as the base of the template. I glue the printed template to stiff cardboard. After drying, I attach pieces of plywood against which LEDs can be laid. The fit doesn't have to be perfect. The most important thing is that the bolts don't move during soldering. Half an hour and columns are ready. Time for testing. I uploaded code to ESP. Then I assembled a makeshift tester and quickly caught the first and last error. This strip is not working properly and this one LED is to blame. As you can see, this solder is not connecting at all. It remains to combine all the strips. I started by cutting wires into smaller pieces and removing insulation from both ends. I twist the wires and solder them to form a long chain. I connected both upper and bottom power pins of LED columns. Input and output signals are connected alternately, creating zigzag. Finally, I connected the finished matrix to ESP and uploaded another test program. While waiting for delivery with acrylic parts, I continued testing the display. I connected the power supply and assembled the audio circuit. The audio output from my notebook supplies voltage with an amplitude of up to 0.5 volts and average value of zero. In order to correctly read such signal, a system that works with symmetrical power supply is needed. ESP does not support it. However, it can be easily bypassed by adding a constant component to the signal. I connected both channels with 3.3K resistors to the separating capacitor 1 microfarad followed by voltage divider keeping 1.65 DC voltage. I choose a resistance so that the resulting high pass filter does not dump low audio frequencies. For this RC circuit, the cutoff frequency is approximately 3.2 Hz. Let's check how it works in practice. I assemble the circuit, connect the audio signal, set the frequency to 440 Hz. Then I attach the first probe. The oscilloscope shows the input signal. A sine wave with a frequency of almost 440 Hz and 1 volt peak to peak. I'm connecting the second probe. On the second channel I set coupling DC so that the constant component is kept. You can clearly see the mentioned shift reaching over 3 divisions, i.e. the expected 1.65 volts. What would happen if I change the value of passive components? For 4.7K resistors and 100 nF capacitor, the cutoff frequency is as high as 677Hz. You can see the effect on the output. The signal is dumped 2.58 times, which means that the attenuation in the system is 8.2 decibels. There is also non-zero phase shift. 
Although such signal can be given to ADC, it is not recommended. To get an amplitude of 0.5 volts, you have to crank up volume to maximum. This prevents any tweaking of gain and brings unwanted noise. Therefore, an amplifier is needed. I use the TDA2822 preamplifier that works even from 3 volts. The gain of the circuit is about 40 dB. To not exceed the limit, signal before IC should be lowered using potentiometer. There are two signal sources in parallel, audio jack and microphone. I used 5 pin, 3.5 mm jack socket for switching those sources. When the plug is removed, the pairs of contact close, opening the way for the signal from the microphone. To sum up, the electronic part of the device is not too complicated. It requires some experience with popular components and some knowledge about analog electronics. The most time-consuming part was the assembling of the matrix and the rest of the project is building preamplifier. In the next video I will focus on building the casing and programming this device. So if you are interested in this project, I heartily suggest considering subscribing to this channel to be up to date with upcoming videos. Cheers and thanks for watching.